The National Broadcasting Company, in conjunction with the Fund for Adult Education, presents Democracy in America by Alexis de Tocqueville. What you say, Mr. Governor, surprises me very much, and there are two things I still want to know. Why do you in America not need soldiers on your streets? And why is the governor of the state of New York calmly living in an ordinary boarding house without a trace of pomp or ceremony? The Governor in the Boarding House, a study in American equality. Item two in the series, Democracy in America. Prepared by the Division of General Education of New York University under the direction of George Probst, American historian. A series designed to bring to life the America of 1831, as recorded by Alexis de Tocqueville, and so to illuminate the image of democracy itself. A study in American equality. The Governor in the Boarding House. May 1831, our first day in New York City. And to our surprise and delight, we were visited early in the morning by a gentleman we had come to know on the ship, an enthusiastic American gentleman named Mr. Schomerhorn. Tocqueville, here is Mr. Schomerhorn to see us. What a pleasant surprise. How kind of you to think of us. Well, you two seem to be important men. Did you see the Mercantile Adventure, one of the morning papers? No. Well, have a look right here. The Mercantile Adventurer of New York, May 12th, 1831. Two magistrates, Messrs. de Beaumont and de Tocqueville, have arrived here, sent by the Ministry of the Interior to examine the various prisons in our country and make a report on their return to France. We have no doubt that every facility will be extended to these gentlemen. Our first taste of democratic hospitality, if true. Oh, it's true enough. Here's how things work out. This paragraph will be picked up by some of the other journals. It'll be passed on from one town to the next and from one state to the next. All kinds of people are going to read it, important people. Then they'll call on you and offer their services. But why? Is that how things are always done in a democracy? That's certainly how things are done here. And the why is really pretty simple. I guess you know we're pretty proud of ourselves over here in America. We observed on the voyage that praises certainly came easily to the lips of Americans. Don't be too polite. It's a little stronger than that. Every book that comes out is exalted to the skies. The public orators flatter the people. The people flatter the orators. Clergymen praise their flocks. And the flocks stand amazed at the excellence of their clergymen. Well, I want to inquire Sunday about school religion. teachers admire their pupils and the scholars magnify their teachers. <laughs> and here's something you'll find out for yourselves. As far as guests from abroad are concerned, you'll find that you're going to need a dark corner to hide your faces in when everybody starts to praise you. But who will praise us, Mr. Shermerhorn? We are merely two inquisitive young men from France. Why are we praised? Were they? Well, that's what I was coming to. We're boasters, I admit it. We're proud of ourselves, I admit that. Oh. But we aren't all that proud. We haven't been in business long enough yet. Oh, we still aren't quite sure of ourselves. We have a lot of hard things to say about the old world, but even while we're saying them, we're sometimes casting a look out of the corner of our eye to see whether we've really impressed them or not. And you being sent here by your government means you people think we've got something to teach you. Possibly. The new world has got to jump on the old world, and the old world admits it. That's why you're going to be flattered and popular. That's why things are going to be easy for you. France is trying to learn something from America. You've heard the old proverb. Imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, and we reckon your flattery right now is pretty sincere. I begin to understand. This may make our task a little easier, eh, Tocqueville? Uh, now, look. In New York City, we get moving early. People will soon be calling on you. You'll get invitations from all over the place. So I want to get in ahead of them. I've arranged for you to see Enos Throop. Oh, this is charming of you, but who is this Mr. Throop? Enos Thompson Throop, sir, is the governor of the state of New York. The governor? This is certainly an honor. Normally, the governor resides in the city of Albany, but he's in New York City right now for the Tammany Society dinner. What is the Tammany Society? We will find out. Uh, no, I've made all the arrangements. Mr. Morse, who's a judge at Cherry Valley, he'll introduce. Morse is a friend of mine. Nice fellow. I've written it down for you. Here's the address. <laughs> What a scene of hurry and bustle in these streets. I wonder if all this running is typical of a democracy. You notice everybody overtakes us. I thought myself a lively enough walker, but over here I seem only to dawdle. 
Why do the citizens of a democracy hurry? How do we know, Tocqueville, these are typical citizens? Elsewhere, things may be very different. This New York is only one city in a vast country. Do not begin, I beg you, to build your theories until you have more facts. Well, they all seem to wear the same clothes. Certainly, there seems to be a great deal of outward equality. All the classes seem to be intermingled. This sort of thing would be preposterous in Paris. I wonder what this Governor Throop is going to be like. I took a few notes. He is 47 years old, formerly a circuit judge. What is a circuit judge, I wonder? And he was only elected governor this year. Do you know what a circuit judge is, Beaumont? Beaumont? Hmm? Oh, oh, forgive my inattention. <laughs> you are observing the crowds. Uh, yes, but it's not only the people who are here that interest me, so much as the ones that are missing. Missing? There are almost no children and no soldiers. No children and no soldiers. If we had walked this far in the French city, we should have seen hundreds of children and dozens of soldiers. Now, where are they? Huh? It will give us something to ask Governor Troop. <laughs> Well, here is the governor's residence. How very peculiar. A boarding house, exactly like our own. Knock on the door. How will people believe us when we say that the chief magistrate of the state of New York lives in an ordinary boarding house? Possibly he and his entourage have taken over the premises. I'm sure we'll find him surrounded by the pomp and ceremony appropriate to his situation. Uh, good morning. Gustave de la Bonniniere de Beaumont and Alexis de Tocqueville for an audience with the governor of New York. Permit me to present our credentials from the government of France. You're the two French fellows old Shermerhorn told me about. You're surely welcome. Step right on in and meet the governor. I'm Judge Moss and I'm real pleased to meet you. It is an honor. Uh, forgive me, I do not know the proper address toward a person in your station. Just call me Judge. You and shut the door behind you, will you? You just call any man here what you want to call him. But the fancier you call him, the more he'll be pleased. I thought there were no aristocratic titles in a democracy. We've managed to scrape up a few non-aristocratic ones. You couldn't toss a rock out into any street of New York City any hour of the day or night without bringing down at least a colonel. Why, just the other day, I heard tell of a delegation from one of the counties of Florida. There were 18 men in it. Four generals, six colonels, three majors, one ex-governor, one doctor, and one esquire. That left only two fellows that were just people. Uh, here we are. Governor, meet Mr. Tocqueville and Mr. Beaumont. Uh, gentlemen, meet Governor Throop. Delighted to have the honor. Excellency. Excellency. Uh, which of you fellows is which? I am Alexis de Tocqueville, Excellency. Mm. And I am Gustave de Beaumont at your service. Well, that's dandy. Pull up a chair and sit down. You boys seem to have got the American language pretty well licked. We have applied ourselves conscientiously, Excellency. Call the governor Mr. Governor. He won't know who you're talking to. <laughs> Forgive us, Mr. Governor. <laughs> Allow me to offer you some tobacco, gentlemen? Uh, no, thank you, Judge. No, thank you. Oh, you gentlemen don't chew? No? Well, you're quite right. It's a filthy habit. Disgusting. Hand over the plug, Judge, and I'll take a bite. I wish I'd never taken it up. First, excellent, uh, Mr. Governor, let me present my credentials. Oh, I don't need credentials. I read all about you in the papers. Come look over the prisons. And to see what it is like in a democracy. Oh, I'm sure we'll do everything in our power to help you. you uh, you've been having a little trouble over there in France, I guess. Uh, governments going up and down, things like that. Oh, don't like to say anything. Well, that's smart and patriotic, too. We admire patriots over here. What do you make of us, Mr. Tocqueville? How do you mean? How do you like America? We like it very much. What little we have seen of it. <laughs> I see you're in the tact and discernment business, too. But everything is so different from France. Uh, even on the streets, there are differences. Uh, where are the children? Children? Why, well, I guess they'd be in school, wouldn't you say, Judge? Sure. That's where they are. Unless they're playing hooky. All the children are educated? Well, just about as many as we can lay our hands on. We Americans are great believers in public education and self-improvement. 
<laughs> Did you think we didn't have any children? Well, I thought they might be working in factories or something of the sort. Oh, some of them, I guess, are, but most will be in school. And also, there are no soldiers. Now, how do you keep up law and order without soldiers? Well, <clears throat> we have soldiers. Every man you see is a soldier. The Constitution of our Union lays it down as a sacred right of every citizen to bear arms. If we ever had need of soldiers, you'd find them springing up all around you. It's happened before, and if it's needed, it'll happen again. Every man fit to bear arms is his own soldier. This I understand, uh, Mr. Governor, although it surprises me. But there is something else about it that surprises me even more. First, why is the governor of the state of New York living in a boarding house without pomp and ceremony? And second, why do you not positively need at least some soldiers on your streets? How does your society hold together without the splendor of the civic arm and the might of the military arm? Well, gentlemen, I'll tell you. It's because we in America have started on a great adventure. I am afraid, Mr. Governor, that I do not understand you. Monsieur de Beaumont and myself, we are on an adventure. Everything we see is full of surprises. <laughs> like finding the governor of the state of New York in a boarding house? Exactly. Well, it's convenient, that's what it is. If there's one thing that's hard to find nowadays around New York City, it's domestic help. And don't you see, the governor doesn't have to worry about his prestige or anything like that. It doesn't come from himself, you see, it comes from the people. Don't forget this is a democracy. Even if we wish to forget it... Which we... I assure you we do not. Yeah. We find it thrust upon us at every point. Well, I guess every country's proud of its native institutions. And I guess we Americans are a little prouder than the average because we figure we really have something to be proud about. I believe we have noticed that. <laughs> I believe you have, Mr. Tocqueville. I wouldn't be surprised if you haven't been pumped up to the eyebrows with boasting from everyone you've met, myself included. <laughs> Still, if you're on a good thing, you want other people to know about it. And you are convinced, Mr. Governor, that this democracy is a good thing? Sure, I'm convinced. Oh, not that it hasn't its uh, bad side, mind you, and Judge Morris here and myself know all about it. We've sat on the bench and judged our fellow creatures in a pretty miserable bunch. Some of them turned out to be, too. They surely did. Uh, but even there, I take issue with you, Mr. Governor. Go ahead. Well, I had a fellow before me one day who was by way of being a burglar. This fellow had broken into a good-looking house, but when he got in, he found there was more to the wrap-in than there was to the package. I beg your pardon. The place looked good, but there was nothing worth stealing inside. He hunted around a spell, couldn't find anything he wanted, so he finally left. But when he got outside, he found it had come on to rain. Back he goes into the house and steals a fine new cotton umbrella. It was just coming on daylight when he got back into the city, and this umbrella was getting to be an embarrassment to him. He didn't want to be caught with it. I asked him why he didn't get rid of it. Well, now, Judge, I tell you, he said, I calculated there'd be even more trouble if anyone had caught me heaving it away. So what he did, he gave it to a friend in the same line of business as himself. They caught the friend, the friend said where he'd got the umbrella from, and this other fellow's in the penitentiary right now, thinking it all <laughs> over. Well, that's a good story, Judge, but I don't see where it fits in. It fits in this way, Mr. Governor. We've got our bad eggs and our rotten apples, same as anyone else. But even when they're bad, they've got a democratic flavor about them. That fella talked to me from the dock as though I were his equal. It, no, he did better than that. He talked to me as though he were my employer. If you will forgive me, sir, your story shows me something else. The way you tell it shows me a sort of fundamental sympathy with this wrongdoer. I wouldn't exactly say that. A good judge ought to come at a criminal the way he goes for a bottle of port. Try him carefully, then punish him severely. But nonetheless, I detect a feeling that this man is, after all, a human being. Well, isn't he? Oh, quite so. But in our country, there are many people who find it very hard to realize that. Madame de Sévigné, for instance, she was a brilliant, sensitive woman, but a true aristocrat. 
It would be scarcely unfair to say that Madame de Sévigné, like many aristocrats, had no clear notion of suffering in anyone who was not a person of quality. Yes, I see what you mean. That certainly isn't true here. We have our faults, but on the whole, I believe we're a humanitarian people. We like to think well of people, and usually we have a basic belief in fair play. Mm -hmm. But, uh, Mr. Governor, to return to the question of soldiers... Oh, yes, yes. Uh, why aren't there any? Is that what you mean? Exactly. Yeah. Or uh, is this just peculiar to the city of New York? We've already been told several times that New York is not, after all, America. Nor is it. But you won't find much in the way of soldiers wherever you go. As I said, we're on an adventure. Every man Jack has a stake in the country. It's to his own benefit to live in a peaceful, happy community. Everything, in short, is regulated as far as possible by enlightened self-interest, which is the basis of our democracy. Every man is every man's equal. Every man is every man's associate. Every man is every man's customer. Put your society on those terms, Mr. Tocqueville, and you'll not need the military because you will have extinguished the mob, that body of the poor and depressed who can have no interest in the stability which never steadies them, a settled tranquility which never relaxes them, a prosperity which never touches them. The bond of this mighty continental nation, gentlemen, for to tell you the truth, I don't know whether we're a nation or a continent yet, the bond is commercial liberty. Not mere political liberty, but positive freedom from all the slightest restraints. That is the birthright of this growing country. Is freedom from all restraints wholly good, Mr. Governor? <laughs> is anything wholly good, Mr. Tocqueville? I don't know. I'm sure it must have its dark side, and I'm equally sure that this country wants it and that this country's got it. It is a heritage as natural as the air we breathe, whether it sweetens the hard toil of New England or inflates the hot pride of the South. It's always the same brave spirit pervading the same republic. And its influence is not the less powerful because it is everywhere propagated by an animating spirit of dispute. Animating spirit. Ah, you are taking notes, Mr. Tocqueville. I'm glad to see you do it. Uh, to take a note of this. The American people, dispersed over an immense territory, abounding in all the means of commercial greatness, who early found an opportunity of adapting their government to their circumstances... Adapting their government to their circumstances. Yeah, they followed the manifest order of nature when they adopted a constitution which was free, a constitution which was republican, and a constitution which was based on a commercial federation. But, Mr. Governor, was that desirable? Uh, no, sir. I will not comment on its desirability, except to say this. As far as we are concerned, it is infinitely desirable, because it was wholly inevitable. Will you uh, forgive me if I speak for a moment of your own country and speak to you privately as a man? We should be honored. Very well, sir. Your country, too, has recently passed through a great revolution, but one which I cannot help feeling has had a very different influence on your destiny. You will forgive the strong language, but I cannot help but remark that the course, and indeed the catastrophe, of the French Revolution has cast a gloom over republicanism which perhaps it may never shake off, and which renders it, in Europe, repulsive and discreditable at least for the present. But here, sir, is the difference between your revolution and ours. The American Republic is the natural fruit of the American soil. The spirit of freedom may be impassioned, it may be factious, but it is neither furious nor bloody. The strong bonds of union are here and will remain. There is a common language, there are common laws, there are common political attachments, and finally, and above all, there is the great reciprocal bond of common interest. Remember this always, gentlemen. We live on trade. We live by trade. We live for trade. Trade is our life. And I tell you frankly, 
We all regard the carrying on of trade as something to which a man may honorably devote his whole life. And indeed, while we are talking today, a hundred ships are discharging their cargoes and a thousand emigrants from all parts of the globe are landing with big hearts and stout hopes to realize their dreams of a free and happy West. Everywhere we are pursued by this wild enthusiasm for trade. There are also street criers in France. Oh, but these street criers are different. They have meaning. They belong to a pattern. Sweep all, sweep all up, sweep all up from the bottom to the top without ladder or rope. Sweep. You're eyeing that chimney sweep as if he were a future millionaire of this new democracy. Who knows? Perhaps he may be. <laughs> the governor's ideas have excited you. What we are seeing, Beaumont, is a new world whale unfolding. Whale oil, fill apps, fine whale oil. Cattails, cattails to make beds going. Cattails, cattails. Well, she's selling reeds and bulrushes. I will not write down that Americans sometimes sleep on the tails of cats. Look across the street. In front of every shop, there are long boards nailed across two posts with appeals for trade on them. Visit the pleasure railway at Hoboken. Bars, warm, cold, shower and vapor, sulfur and other medicated bars in marble and tin tubs. Tocqueville. Stop looking at those silly signs and listen for a moment. Certainly, I'm all ears. Dogs. That is the sound of dogs. Quite so, but what are they doing to them? Look. Look down there. There are men running after dogs and killing them with clubs. Let us go and see. But this is appalling. There's blood all over the road. And seven, eight... Nine dead dogs beaten to death. This is a strange scene for a humanitarian country. It recalls what one has read of the reign of terror. <laughs> Pardon me, sir, but why are these men killing so many dogs? Are you a foreigner? Yes, sir. From Germany, likely. Uh, no, from France. You over here in business? Uh, you might say so, uh, but uh, why are these dogs... Uh, haberdashery? Hardware? Export and import? Anything that strikes our fancy. These dogs... General what... line, eh? Same as me. Uh, very possibly. Uh, my name's Hawkins. I don't believe I caught your name. Tocqueville. It sounds foreign. Well, of course. You said you were a foreigner. Dutch name? <laughs> From France. Blame me. That's what you said. I don't believe I caught your name, sir, either. Uh, my name is Beaumont. Oh, that sounds foreign. No, wait, you told me. Swedish name? Also French. Well, that's refreshing. I'm certainly honored to make the acquaintance. And now, what can I do for you? <laughs> Why are all those men killing all those dogs? Why, they're the city dog killers. What else would you expect them to do? This, then, is their job? Around here, there are too many dogs. They just run wild in the streets. You've got to do something about them. Usually, we've got to kill off four or 5,000 in a year. In the hot weather, they're knocking them down at the rate of 300 a day. But it is so cruel. Look, sometimes the animals are only maimed. What else would you suggest? I wouldn't want to do the job myself. I don't like getting blood all over me. But I'll tell you this. The job's got to be done. We Americans don't like anybody criticizing anything that we reckon we ought to do. At least of all, Italians and Portuguese and foreigners generally. So I think you'd find it wise to remember that. And not be so free with your unwarranted accusations. I give you a good day. Well, 
Evidently, an American Democrat can be just as sensitive and touchy as a European aristocrat. But the European boasts of what his country is. The American of what it does. Let us leave the shambles. Already I can see it's not going to be very easy to understand this country. More noise. There is a band now. Surely the streets of New York must be the noisiest and busiest in the world. And yet, for all their bustle and prosperity, I feel all the time that we are walking about in a city which is nothing but one gigantic suburb. There they go, across the end of the street. Flags, banners, bands. What can all this be? Three cheers for the clock makers! I can hardly believe my own eyes. This is a parade of tradesmen, of mechanics. Look at them, look at the banners. The butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker. It is miraculous. Did you ever see such assurance, such confidence, such calm complacency with which these fellows hold up all the traffic? And listen to the cheers of the people. Yes, the governor told us that these people think that the carrying on of trade is something to which a man may honorably devote his whole life. And look at their clothes. Sleek coats, glossy hats, gay watch cards, and doe skin gloves. Hey there, look at the dandy mechanics. Give them three cheers, boys. Three cheers for the dandy mechanics. Dandy Mechanics. It is the right name for them. There is an unbelievable outward equality in America. The whole country has melted into a middle class. A remarkable thing. A country blessed with nature's richest gifts and selected by providence for the noblest experiment tried by man, which is not only the civilization of a new world, but the practical establishment of principles that till now have only had an ideal existence. A great people which has no army, a country full of activity and vigor where the action of the government is hardly perceived. A world given up to trade and equality and proud of both. You have just heard The Governor in the Boarding House, a study in American equality, item two, in a series based on Alexis de Tocqueville's Democracy in America. This series, presented by the National Broadcasting Company, was prepared by the Division of General Education of New York University under the direction of George Probst, American historian. Produced in the studios of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation by Andrew Allen, script by Lister Sinclair, Music by Lucio Agostini. This series, Democracy in America, is made possible by a grant from the Fund for Adult Education as part of a general course of study in the nature of American society. For information about the use of these de Tocqueville dramatizations for study or discussion, and how to secure these new materials about American democracy at a reasonable charge, write to the American Foundation for Continuing Education, Post Office Box 749, Chicago 90, Illinois. Now this is Ben Grower inviting you to join us next week for Item 3, the 4th of July in Albany, 1831, on Democracy in America. An American in Orbit, now scheduled Saturday on NBC.